with that introduction let's uh, get to uh, hybrid arq so now uh, some of you may be working in 5g obviously this uh, talk is very relevant to your work but even those of you who are not working in 5g the first part of the talk is going to be covering hybrid arq as a concept so that is common to any kind of uh, uh, communication networking uh, uh, protocol it's not uh, exclusive to 5g so the first part of the talk we are going to spend uh, some amount of time talking about what hybrid arq is and what are the different types of hybrid arq then we'll get into how hybrid arq is uh, specified for 5g new radio okay so that would be the second part of the talk so let's uh, start with the basics of hybrid arq so let's start with the simple diagram uh, which is not exclusive to 5g or wifi or anything like that this is very common in any kind of uh, communication technology or networking so there is a sender who is sending packets to a receiver but of course the channel in between is not perfect not all the pa packets are going to arrive at the receiver correctly so in this example packet number 2 is kind of corrupted the receiver may uh, receive the packet or it, it may be completely lost in the channel or the receiver may receive the packet but the packet is in error right so that is the case you know uh, yeah, in this example so the receiver gets packet 1 and then it gets packet 2 which is an error then the receiver gets packet 3 so what the receiver does it gives a feedback back to the sender hey look i uh, didn't receive packet 2 correctly can you resend the packet so sender responds by resending the packet so this is a classical retransmission mechanism which we call it there's a fancy name to it we call it automatic repeat request arq so that's where you know the acronym comes from so everything is uh, simple uh, in this case uh, just retransmit the erroneous packet take the second example where packets 4 5 and 6 are sent by the sender again same thing happens packet number 5 is corrupted receiver receives the corrupted packet 5 but now the receiver is uh, sort of having a little bit of more processing power more intelligence and the packet also has a little bit of uh, encoding uh, you know uh, uh, that's part of the packet so now the receiver rather than simply detecting the error it is also able to correct the error so you see if you see, look at the previous use case in this use case with arq the receiver was only able to detect the error it's not able to correct the error but with forward error correction the receiver is not only detects the error in packet 5 but it is also able to correct it so this is called forward error correction we will come to it later how these things are implemented i am just giving a broad overview so what is hybrid arq hybrid arq is nothing but combining both of these it is a combination of both arq as well as forward error correction so what happens in hybrid arq take this example packet 7 and 8 7 8 and 9 are sent by the sender 8 is corrupted so typically what uh, the receiver does it doesn't discard the packet 8 which is corrupted it stores it in its, in its buffer and then it tells the sender please resend the packet now sender will resend the packet number 8 it may be slight variation of the packet it's not a big bit exact copy of the original transmission there may be differences between the packet that was sent earlier and the packet that is coming here 8b in any case now what the receiver will do it will combine both the transmissions it will combine 8 and 8b and it will try, try to do a better decoding of the packet so as you can see here hybrid arq is combination of both arq as well as fec so when it ask for a retransmission it is basically arq that is what arq does when it is trying to decode that is to say correcting the errors it is basically what fec does so essentially hybrid arq is a combination of these two so now you may ask uh, okay this is hybrid arq it looks fine 
Now the obvious question is, how does the receiver detect errors? How does the receiver correct errors? What is the difference between these two? So the answer is also quite simple. Those who are, of us who are in communication engineering, you will know that uh, most packets, they have something called CRC, cyclic redundancy check. So that is a field which is attached to the packet. It is computed from the information bits. And uh, that CRC has the capability uh, to detect errors. So the receiver will look at the information bits plus the CRC field and using that it will say, okay, this packet is in error. What about uh, error correction? How is it possible to correct errors? So for, for correcting errors, there is a separate uh, uh, mathematical concept called error correcting codes. So you might have uh, read about it uh, long back in your engineering, when you are studying engineering or even in your day-to-day uh, -day work, you may be encountering this. So there are a number of error correcting codes. Uh, uh, the classical ones are convolutional codes. That is one of the oldest codes, block codes, right? Convolutional codes are also block codes. Then you have Reed Solomon codes, BCH codes. So all these are error correcting codes. Uh, more recently for HARC, uh, that is for hybrid ARQ, the kind of error correcting codes that have been adopted are uh, uh, turbo codes, turbo product codes, polar codes, LDPC, which is low density parity check codes. So these are the other different codes, you know, which are used for correcting errors. So if you are new to this, I will try to explain it in a simple way. Suppose the original packet has 100 bits. What this, these error correcting codes do is that they will transform that 100 bits into 150 bits. That means they are adding some extra 50 bits through that error cor correcting code procedure. And these extra 50 bits give the receiver the power to correct for errors. Now, of course, it can correct only a certain threshold of errors. Suppose 10 bits are in error, it may be able to correct that. But if 20 bits are in error, the receiver will give up. This, these are too many errors, I give up. So please resend the packet. So that is where hybrid ARQ comes in. So if the channel is really poor, a lot of bits are in error, it will not be possible to correct for all the errors. Then what the hybrid ARQ uh, protocol will do, it will ask the receiver, sender to resend the packet. Once the re, uh, retransmitted packet is received, now the receiver has two things. It has the original packet plus the retransmitted packet. Now both, those, both these are going to be useful to do a better decoding. So that's what the hybrid ARQ protocol does. Okay, so this is uh, what hybrid ARQ is at a very high level. Let's get into some of the inner details of hybrid ARQ. So what is the typical pipeline of a hybrid ARQ procedure? So these are the information bits. Let's say it is coming from a higher layer. Let's say it's coming from, uh, you know, link layer to physical layer, stuff like that. You know, in the layers, will vary from one standard to another. So information bits come in, then HARC. It adds, it uses the CRC generator to add CRC here. So this gives it the ability to detect for errors, but that is not going to be enough. Then it gives the entire bit stream to the FEC encoder. So what the FEC encoder does, it adds some extra bits based on the error correcting codes. So these bits give now give the bit stream or the packet the ability to correct for errors. So this is for detecting the errors. This is for correcting the errors. Then it goes through a bunch of other blocks, which we will not go through in detail, interleaver, modulator, buffer, and so on. On the receiver side, the reverse procedure happens, demodulator, deinterleaver, FEC decoder. CRC check and information bits. So this part is a little bit important to understand. So FEC decoder first, you know, tries to correct for errors. So that means it will try to find a valid code word, which is uh, uh, as close as possible to what has been received. But FEC decoder doesn't know uh, that, uh, like it doesn't have the knowledge that it has done the decoding correctly. What if, you know, 20 bits are in error? 
a fec decoder has a limit it can probably detect uh, maybe 10 bits in error what if 20 bits in are in error so decoder doesn't know that it will simply say this is what i have decoded please check this is where the crc checker comes into play based on what is given to it it can immediately tell whether the packet is in error or not so it is doing a detection of error if it detects an error it implies that what fec decoder has done is probably wrong that means too many bits are in error and this guy has not been able to correct it that is the you know uh, uh, implication of that so these two things are not kind of independent although they operate independently both are essential to uh, guarantee good communication on the air interface okay so that is where hark is if there is an error what happens you send a feedback if you got the packet correctly you send a ack if you did not get it correctly you send a negative ack and based on this you know the sender will do a retransmission so notice on both sides you have buffer so this is important to observe the reason we have this buffer is fundamentally this whole thing is also arq right retransmission so to do the retransmission you need the buffer to store the uh, original information bits and whatever you have added in between so that is the reason you have the buffer and why do we have the buffer in the receiver side because if you remember recall our earlier example you receive the original transmission plus the retransmission so you uh, you can do a better decoding if you combine the original with the re retransmitted packets so that is the reason you have a, bu a buffer uh, on the receiver side as well okay so this is the overall processing pipeline for uh, hybrid arq so now let's quickly look at uh, some of the variations of hybrid arq so this is a very uh, important concept to understand you might have heard these terms suppose you are working in 5g or any of the other wireless standards you might have heard these terms the two terms we are going to look at now is chase combining and incremental redundancy so it's very important to understand what these two are and uh, how uh, they are relevant to hark so going back to this figure uh, we made a mention that you know in the combiner multiple Uh, transmissions of a packet are combined so let's assume that the packet was originally transmitted it was in error and then two retransmissions happened so finally the receiver has three copies of the packet it has the original transmission plus two retransmissions so the combiner what it does is it combines all these three versions of the packet to do a better decoding but how this combination is done there are many uh, different techniques so two of those techniques are chase combining and incremental redundancy okay so at a very high level chase combining is very simple this is your information bits you added the crc and then you added the error correcting code so this is also called channel coding so now the bit stream is completely transformed from the original one now what uh, the transmitter or the sender is going to do he is going to do the initial transmission and if it is in error he will simply do a retransmission 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 n number of times for every retransmission the sender is going to send exactly the same bit stream he is not going to change anything that means whatever was transmitted in the first transmission the same thing is repeated so this is called chase combining so nothing is different here except that the combined energy of the packet is higher that means the receiver now has more energy to decode the packet because you have received four copies of the same packet that is what it is now let's look at a more intelligent scheme uh, which requires a different mechanism of transmission so same thing you have the information bits you add the crc and then you add the channel coding but now you do the channel coding in such a way like you have to select the proper kind of channel code which supports incremental redundancy and as a consequence of this what you do is every time you do a retransmission you don't send the same bits as you can see here in the first first transmission 
only the first few bits were sent in the second transmission another set of bits were sent in the third transmission the last set of bits were sent so it doesn't mean that you know uh, the bits sent uh, between any of these transmissions are unique no there can be overlap you can resend some of these bits in the second transmission or in the third transmission that is allowed but what is important in the incremental redundancy is with every transmission you add more redundancy to the uh, to the packet uh, packet transmission so let's try to explain what is this redundancy let's go back to our original example where you have 100 bits coming in this is the actually information or message you want to tell the receiver but to protect these 100 bits you have added another let's say 50 bits here okay and apart from that here in channel coding you have ad added another 50 bits so instead of adding sending the original 100 bits you are ending up with sending 200 bits to the receiver but in the first transmission you may send only the first 100 bits okay you don't send any of the extra 100 bits you have added that means first transmission is actually the original information bits that you have uh, received from the other layer but when you come to the first retransmission maybe you will take 30 information bits and then you will send 70 of the extra bits that you added right remember you added uh, 100 extra bits out of that you send 70 uh, bits plus 30 of the original information bits so that goes into into the first retransmission then when you come to the second retransmission assuming that even after this the receiver is unable to decode the packet because the cha channel is so poor then in the second retransmission you add more redundancy remember that there are 30 more bits which are redundant which you have not sent to the receiver so you send those as well along with you know maybe the 70 redundant bits you already sent here so now in the last retransmission you send 100 uh, redundant bits now with this the receiver has more information to decode the entire packet correctly so this is the concept of incremental redundancy in the first uh, transmission you did not send any of the redundant bits that you added as extras in the first retransmission you sent 70 of those then in the second retransmission you sent 30 more so that means at every stage you are accumulating more redundant bits in the transmission so that the receiver has more chance to decode the packet so this is the concept of incremental redundancy Uh, hi uh, i have a question actually sorry uh, yeah go ahead uh, hi uh, uh, my name is krishnakant uh, so uh, uh, every time we will send uh, original bits in the first transmission is it just so or uh, yeah so first most of the, uh, most, of the most of the protocols defined today are like that in incremental redundancy the first transmission will contain all the information bits what is the reason for that because let's say the channel is really good the receiver should be able to decode this packet and move on that means no retransmission is required okay so need... so during first transmission we will transmit only the information bits not no, the no, not, oh, not only you may transmit extra uh, redundancy bits as well Ah uh -huh, okay so yeah. but all the information bits have to be present in the first transmission that is the point Ah uh ha -huh, okay in addition to that we can transmit crc also crc will uh, yeah will always be there right crc is he over here So uh, no, crc I mean, uh, will also be there uh, okay 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 i just want to clarify one more time so we have 100 100 information bits let's say yeah yeah so during first transmission we will send yeah, i think uh, just hold on i think my example i uh, uh, said the wrong thing because i said 100 plus 50 here right yes uh, so this this crc naturally will go through because without crc the receiver cannot detect the error okay so compulsory crc is a must crc is a must okay so during first transmission we have to transmit information bits plus crc 
plus crc and optionally you may also send some of these bits that you added in channel coding optionally okay that is depending on how the protocol is defined so 5g may define it in a certain way uh, you know uh, uh, ieee 15.4 will define it in a different way bluetooth will define it in a different way so it depends on how the protocol is defined according to that you know you have to that protocol will specify how to do the first transmission aha uh -huh. okay but in general we have to transmit all the information bits in uh, first transmission yes so i explained what is the reason for that the reason is if the channel is really good you don't need to do any of the retransmissions yes that's correct and yeah. i have one so, more question uh, uh, can you please go to the previous slide there is a buffer no buffer uh, yeah so how much time we will keep it them in the buffer is there any time limit there will be time limit no you cannot keep them for, for, forever no that is again very much dependent on the protocol 5g defines it differently uh, bluetooth may define it differently and so on so typically people will not specify how much time what they specify is maximum number of retransmissions aha uh -huh, okay so that number defines this buffer okay okay once we reach the maximum then we'll discard them yeah okay okay thank you thank you yeah any further questions you can ask questions later let's move on what are the different types of hark so in literature people identify three types of hark type 1 type 2 and type 3 so in the simplest case what happens if there are errors you know because fec is part of the packet forward error correcting is there so errors can be corrected and if errors are not i mean if uh, the packet errors cannot be corrected the receiver will simply discard the packet and it will ask for a retransmission that is the simplest type of type 1 but within type 1 there is another alternative case where you do chase combining which we saw here right multiple copies of the same bit stream are transmitted and the receiver will uh, combine them and uh, try to do a decode decoding so that is what type type 1 is type 2 is basically incremental redundancy which we have been talking about so far so what we call as incremental redundancy is just another uh, name for type 2 then there is something called type 3 right so now to understand type 2 let's go back to this let's say uh, we had a discussion just now that the first transmission contains all the information bits it will also be apparent in the discussion that the retransmissions don't contain all the information bits because they contain mostly the redundant bits which you have added in this process so which means that just looking at the one retransmitted packet the decoder can uh, receiver cannot decode the packet which means the receiver has to have the original transmission plus the retransmission to do the proper decoding right so that is one of the problems with type 2 so that is where type 3 comes in where every transmission that is the original transmission plus any of the retransmission every transmission is self decodable which means that if you want you can decode the packet purely from the retransmitted packet without depending on the initial transmission so that is what we call as type 3 okay and there are other things in the literature which we will not go through uh, now there are couple of uh, minor variations of hark so earlier the gentleman asked you know uh, over here how much time you store in the buffer i said typically protocols may or may not specify how, what is the maximum number of retransmissions so if the maximum number of retransmissions are specified we call it truncated hark that means once the maximum is reached the packet will be discarded by the sender itself because sender is basically giving up whereas if no maximum is specified by the protocol we call it persistent hark that means you keep on retransmitting until the receiver receives the packet there is no limit on the number of retransmissions now there is another variation called time truncated hark which is used by uh, some systems 
so here there is a timing constraint as well so for example in iot uh, one of the lower layer protocols that is used is called ieee 15.4 that is used in iot system specifically low power wide area networks so there there is also a time constraint that means the packet has to be transmitted within this time so there is also you know there could also be a constraint on the number of retransmissions but in but in addition to that there is also a time constraint so then we call that time truncated arc okay so now the question is can you think of any reason why a practical system you know will do something like this persistent arc that means you keep retransmitting until the receiver receives the packet correctly so in practical sense uh, in a, in a, in, a, in the real world it doesn't make any sense you cannot be indefinitely or infinitely retransmitting until the receiver receives the packet so uh, what is the use of you know uh, even giving it a name so this is actually of theoretical importance so when researchers uh, you know do theoretical analysis of arc they always define uh, am i analyzing persistent arc or am i analyzing truncated arc so the analysis procedure varies but from a practical real world perspective you know you will rarely see persistent arc anywhere real world systems are always truncated arc but it will be surprising for you to know that 5G new radio doesn't specify any limit on the number of retransmissions if you actually study the specs there is no limit on the number of retransmissions however this is the reason for that is there is no need to standardize this this is actually left to the equipment vendor to provide such, such a feature and it can be configured by the operator which is what most uh, operators will do some operators may configure 4 as the number some may go up to 16 right so there will definitely be a limit but it is not something that 5g has standardized so just keep that in mind okay now let's look at two more differences uh, about harp uh, two more variations of harp one is called synchronous and the other is called asynchronous so by the name itself you can figure out and also by this diagram you can figure out what is going on in synchronous arc every retransmission like in this example every retransmission happens like immediately after the acknowledgement is received in this case negative acknowledgement right so a nac is received and immediately after that the next slot or subframe the retransmission happens same thing here so it is very well defined the timing is very well defined that is to say you will also notice that the feedback whether it is nac or ac that comes three slots after the transmission so here in slot 1 the transmission goes slot 4 you get the feedback and then so on here so the timing is well known in advance so that is what we call synchronous the other alternative is asynchronous where the timing is not determined in advance and it is very dynamic so in uh, 5g today we use only asynchronous because it gives us more flexibility and when we look at uh, 5g arc in detail i'll go uh, look into more details about asynchronous then there is another thing called adaptive and non adaptive arc so from this diagram again it is very obvious what is happening in non adaptive arc you will not change the modulation and bandwidth and uh, resource allocation so many other things so between the transmission and the retransmission all of, all these parameters are going to be the same so that is what we call non adaptive arc so take this as an example the original transmission is 16 qom retransmissions are also using 16 qom so that is non adaptive what about adaptive in adaptive case originally you started sending the packet in 16 qom and then you continuously are you are getting uh, negative acknowledgments at the same time you got feedback from the receiver that the channel is bad because remember the receiver is also sending feedback about the quality of the channel so using that you can also adapt so the next retransmission that goes out because you know that the channel is bad you are going to change from 16 qom to qpsk 
and because you are using a lower order modulation you will allocate more resources so that the entire packet can go so all those changes can happen in adaptive whereas in non adaptive it is fixed for a particular packet until the packet gets through so that's the difference between non adaptive and adaptive okay and here i have described you know what are the different ways hark is being adopted by many of the wireless systems 3g does it in a certain way cdma 2000 4g 5g does it in a certain way which we are going to look at a little later wimax does it in a certain way and then 15.4 bluetooth what is missing anyone can figure out what is missing here which major technology is missing in this list gsm gsm uh, any anyone else wifi wifi good wifi is missing in this list why because wifi doesn't do hark what wifi has is only arq that means it only does retransmissions like this so there are you know proposals to uh, bring in hark as well to wifi so uh, right now it doesn't have okay any questions before we move on to 5g specific things so no if there are no questions then we'll look at 5g uh, uh, how a hybrid arq is specified in 5g new radio so the basic concepts are the same you know uh, both fec is there and uh, retransmission is there whatever we covered in the earlier uh, content the same thing holds good i will show you the broad overview here so we covered what is asynchronous adaptive and stuff like that so 5g actually does asynchronous hybrid arq both in the uplink and the downlink and not only asynchronous it is also uh, adaptive that means you are able to change the coding rate you can do both uh, uh, what you call chase combining as well as incremental redundancy both are supported for 5g one of the things is parallel process which we will cover here but before we get into hybrid arq there are actually three retransmissions in uh, 5g some of you may be aware hark is not the only one that is responsible for retransmissions of a packet you can also do retransmission at rlc layer and then pdcp layer right so those of you who are not aware of the stack i can bring up the stack also yeah something like this maybe i get a 5g new radio yeah so these are all the layers of the 5g stack as you can see you have mac you have rlc you have pdcp and then hdap right so now hark is sitting right here at the mac layer and it involves below mac is the physical layer so obviously there is a little bit of division of labor between mac and physical layer for hark operation so hark operates both at the mac layer and physical layer but on top of mac we have rlc and then on top of rlc we have pdcp the question i am putting to you is why are we doing hark when there is already retransmission at rlc layer there is also retransmission at pdcp layer you can see the word also arq is there here so arq is implemented in rlc it is also there in pdcp so why do we need so much uh, of retransmissions and don't forget about this you will finally end up with tcp ip where tcp is also going to be doing retransmission so at so many different levels retransmissions are happening so what is the logic for that uh retransmissions at mac are little bit faster correct yeah so that is the correct answer so the thing is uh 
the requirements for 5G, especially from the applications, are very challenging. Not only 5G, even in uh, uh, 3.5G, what we used to call HSPA plus, even there and then uh, going to 4G and LTE, the requirements have been becoming more and more harder to achieve simply by doing retransmissions at the RLC layer or you know at a higher layer for that matter. So we want to uh, uh, react quickly to packet errors. So typically what, uh, you know, typically why, why do packet errors happen? The main reason for packet error is you select a particular modulation and a coding rate based on your current information about the channel. So let's say right now you got some feedback from the receiver and then you figured out that channel is fairly good. So you decided I'll go with 16 qualm, you know, coding code rate of one by three. Let's assume something like that. And then you started sending packets. Now a little later you got feedback uh, from the receiver saying that, uh, you know, I I'm getting a lot of errors and, the, uh, and uh, you know, the channel is uh, becoming worse. So then what uh, the sender will do, the sender will adapt the modulation encoding rate. So that is what is known as explicit link adaptation, which happens in almost all wireless systems. So that is called explicit link adaptation. But this explicit link adaptation is very slow because it has to wait for a feedback from the other side and based on the feedback, it has to adapt its modulation encoding. So instead what you do is you accept the fact that you don't get your modulation encoding perfect. Whenever you select a modulation encoding, you accept that there are going to be errors, even though you may try to do as good a selection as possible, there are going to be errors. So without explicit link adaptation, how can you correct for errors? That is exactly what Hark is doing. So sometimes Hark is called as implicit link adaptation. Because if you remember our uh, discussion on incremental redundancy, with every transmission, you are adding more redundancy to the, to the packet. So implicitly what you are doing, you are actually decreasing the code rate by adding more redundancy. So instead of doing it through explicit link adaptation, you are doing it implicitly. And by doing that, you are not really uh, waiting for feedback uh, from the opposite side in terms of the channel quality. You are assessing the feedback simply by the acts and knacks. So using that and using incremental redundancy, you are able to uh, do a better job. So timing is one of the things. The other uh, thing is, you know, RLC, if you look at the internals of RLC, RLC has three modes. Acknowledge mode, unacknowledge mode, and transparent mode. So it's only acknowledge mode that does retransmissions, not the other two modes. So how do you protect packets which are in UM and transparent mode? So that is where again R can be useful. And finally, what is the nature of usefulness of retransmissions at PDCP? So what happens if you have a handover from one G node B to another? This is what we call an inter G node B handover. So when uh, such a handover happens, you know, the layers also change. You are now using a different RLC and uh, PD, uh, uh, RLC and MAC layers, you know, uh, because you are now in a different G node B. So the old G node B, even though you have been doing retransmission at RLC, those RLC packets will get flushed. They are no longer relevant. So that is where retransmission at PDCP level helps in the case of uh, inter G node B handovers. Okay, so I hope this gives you a sense of uh, uh, appreciation why we need uh, retransmission at different layers. Yeah, I was like PDCP, we don't send any feedback. Can, uh, come again, can you repeat that? At PDCP, we don't see it uh, send any feedback to network from you side, right? Network Sending any feedback? Do the retransmission. Retransmission happen at PDCP. Or, yeah. But not from you side, we don't send any acknowledgement or NAC. Right? From PDCP layer, it will happen. Uh, otherwise, how will uh, PDCP know? But from you side, uh, we don't see any uh, any. Ek neck uh, configured 
telecom network right? okay the, you can look up the pdcp uh, specs it is a very short specs so there it will tell you how the yes. retransmission works you may be right that there are no acnacs but they must be having a different kind of kind of uh, uh, mechanism see typically uh, retransmission uh, acnac is one of the methods but there is another way in which retransmissions can happen even without acnac so if you are correct that must be the way the way is that uh, uh, many layers expect packets to be uh, delivered in order if packets arrive mm-hmm. out of order then there will be a timer associated with the out of order packets and if the timer so we'll expires if the timer expires then it will simply ask for a retransmission no acnac is required there are you with me yeah, yeah. but uh, if the timer expires we pass the packet to the upper layer but i don't think we have same there yeah. so as i said if you look at the pdcp specs it is a very short spec easy to read your doubt will get clarified Yes, yeah, so timer runs, but uh, once timer expire, we transfer those packet uh, to the upper layer. Right? Yeah. Okay. We just hold uh, at PDCP only. Yeah. So now uh, in 5G, uh, we already described. I already shared with you. Uh, it's asynchronous. It is adaptive, but it is adaptive as far as my reading goes. It is adaptive in the sense that the coding rates and redundancy bit bits can change from one transmission to the next. but now one important thing is this uh, it may not be obvious from this diagram let's say i send a packet don't look at the diagram let's say i send a packet and uh, you know i am, i will not get the feedback immediately i may get the feedback uh, maybe two three slots later right depending on how the scheduling is done and so forth so for those two three slots what do i do uh, should i send more packets or should i wait so that is the question if i wait uh, for the acknowledgement to come i am based basically keeping the channel idle so i am under utilizing the channel which is a waste of uh, spectrum right so to prevent that what they have done is uh, they so they adopt what is called a stop and wait uh, protocol where when a har entity sends a packet it will not send another packet right it will wait for the acknowledgement but when waiting for the acknowledgement the channel will be idle so we don't want under utilization of the channel so we want the channel to be occupied so to solve this problem what 5g has done is uh, they have multiple concurrent hark processes running at the same time so when the first hark process let's say this guy sent a packet when this guy is waiting for acknowledgement acknowledgement may come only here but it doesn't matter we don't uh, waste uh, this time 3 and 4 during 3 and 4 some other process will use it so multiple hark processes are running both in the network side as well in the as well as in the ue side and this multiple stop and wait hark processes make sure that uh, you know the channel is always utilized you are not under utilizing the channel now it it's perfectly possible you may ask you know why why was it designed this way why didn't they use uh, something like rlc because if you look at rlc the rlc is not a stop and wait protocol if you look at rlc acknowledge mode for example they have what is known as a sliding window so you can send n number of packets without getting an acknowledgement and only if your transmit window is full you have to stop sending and wait for acknowledgements so they could have adopted that at uh, for hark as well you know you can send multiple packets and wait for acknowledgement one shot but they have not done that mainly because firstly we are at a lower layer which is hark uh, which is mac and uh, physical where we want to keep things as simple as possible secondly uh, uh, we we want the acknowledgements to be as short as possible in terms of number of bits so to acknowledge this particular packet for one hark process all you need is a single bit one bit but in rlc if you remember i talked about a sliding window their acknowledgements are not so easy because every packet has to be numbered they have what is known as a sequence number and when acknowledgement acknowledgements come in from the receiver end 
the acknowledgement should carry the sequence number to tell the sender you know which particular packet is being acknowledged so that is another reason why you know that kind of a sliding window approach will not be suitable at uh, mac because here we want to keep things very simple and the acknowledgement for hark is as small as just a single bit so that is why we uh, the standard has adopted uh, uh, the concept of stop and wait protocol for hark and multiple concurrent hark processes not only for 5g this thing is there even in 4g and as well as in hspa the same scheme is adopted hello uh, hi um, i have a question uh, actually uh, sorry uh, yeah one by one uh, go ahead uh, so, yes, uh, my name is krishna kan so uh, why rlc arc key is reliable more reliable i mean somewhere in the document uh, that is mentioned as reliable no more reliable which one is more reliable rlc arc rlc retransmissions i mean rlc actually both of them work together rlc arc is uh, uh, as important as hark which is going on at mac and 5 yes but so, i think somewhere in the website is mentioned that uh, rlc arc is more reliable than mac hark i think uh, uh, yes, uh, Somewhere it's a uh, somewhere. I mean, when you screw, yeah. Combination of a combination of fast fast retransmission and uh, RLC is reliable packet delivery. Which is this? Yeah, yeah. There is no such thing as RLC arc is more reliable. As I said, both of them work together as a team. Okay, so okay, okay. Right. See, the reason is. see tcp ip uh, especially for high bandwidth application we are talking about 100 mbps so for uh, something like 100 mbps high bandwidth applications which is going to be common in uh, even in 4g it is common so 4g and 5g so in these kind of applications suppose there is an error what will happen because these are all managed by tcp tcp will think that there is a network congestion and it will immediately start backing off so to avoid this kind of uh, backing off uh, due to tcp you need highly reliable connections at the lower layer and that kind of reliability cannot be achieved just by rlc alone so that is the reason why you need rlc in combination with hark to uh, provide for this kind of application that avoids the tcp congestion conge uh, congestion problems so this uh, diagram we have already seen in a different uh, perspective from the previous uh, discussion so this is explaining what is incremental redundancy this is the first transmission which is in blue and what we call systematic bits is nothing but your information bits and if you notice the first transmission carries all the information bits plus some redundancy bits second uh, then second transmission i mean i am not saying this is how it is but uh, this is an example given in this diagram second transmission carries only redundant bits none of the information bits third transmission carries little bit of redundant bits and little bit of uh, um, a lot of the systematic bits but not the whole of it and then fourth transmission a little bit of systematic bits and then so as you can see here you know uh, first transmission is completely self decodable whereas rv3 it has a lot of systematic bits but it is not self decodable and same thing for the other cases so in uh, 5g sorry. i had a question sorry vivek yeah. here can we go uh, one slide up where the multiple concurrent hark we were showing no uh, let's in that this discussion uh, since we have gone past that topic we'll come back to that at the end uh, i asked that time only uh, krishnan so, okay, oh, okay, no okay go, go ahead ask your question uh, yeah like uh, you told that uh, uh, multiple concurrent will uh, multiple processes will go ahead and uh, one uh, acknowledgement will come on how we will recognize which acknowledgement is which is for which process like uh, multiple concurrent processes are going on and acknowledgement is also coming in yeah uh, this kind or... of low level discussion we can't have in this session because we are talking at a very high level 
okay sorry so for that those things are all well defined in the standard if you look up the standard documents it is all well defined okay i just had a query okay thank you ah uh, yeah but that is all very low level at this high level session uh, we can't discuss that kind of details so i hope this is clear about incremental redundancy uh, so one, one thing i wanted to tell you is uh, which if you are working on this you may already know uh, the kind of uh, error correcting code that 5g uses is called low density parity check code and uh, from this code you know you get the in uh, channel coded bits so what the 5g system will do is it does what is known as puncturing so some of the bits will be removed and it will form four versions of the packet original packet and these versions are numbered as 0 1 2 3 but the order in which it is sent on the channel is 0 2 3 and 1 and in this order rv0 and rv3 are said to be self decodable that means they, you should be able to decode them without relying on the other packets so that is what uh, you know uh, 5g has specified now in terms of the composition of uh, their hark is so as you can see here you know there is a hark entity here uh, which is inside the mac entity what you are looking at is mac so mac is getting logical channels from rlc and then it is sending transport blocks to transport channel so within uh, a mac entity you have the hark entity and hark entity uh, has multiple hark processes as we described so in 4g we could have up to 8 uh, parallel hark processes in uh, 5g we can have up to 16 so that is what it is so in this diagram you can see multiple uh, mac entities are there in the ue uh, why is that uh, and how is that possible that is possible because uh, this Uh, entity is managing master cell group this is ent entity is managing secondary cell group so we'll not get into the details these cell groups uh, you know uh, are uh, relevant to something called dual connectivity which is uh, another concept or a feature in uh, 5g so when uh, uh, network is con connected to multiple cells then you know you have a master cell group and a secondary cell group and in that particular case you have multiple hark entities within the same uh, ue then there is also another diagram which i showed you here yeah so here uh, this is a slightly different concept it is not uh, what you call as dual connectivity there is no master cell group or uh, secondary cell group what we are looking at here is uh, multiple cells but they are all uh, managed by the same uh, kind of uh, mac entity but interestingly uh, within the mac entity there are multiple hybrid arq entities each one managing one cell so each entity is actually managing one carrier aggregate uh, one cell uh, component carrier in a, another feature of 5g called carrier aggregation so just keep this in mind uh, you know uh, just because we are talking about mac entity doesn't mean there is only one hark entity in the ue so there could be multiple uh, hark entities uh, hark uh, entities in the ue depending on uh, how many uh, component carriers are there and depending on whether you have a master cell group and a secondary cell group so those things also matter so that was uh, this particular diagram and some explanation is given here which we will not go through So let's go back to this diagram where we talked about uh, logical channels, transport channels, and all that. Um, so what is actually uh, what is uh, see in the previous example we talked about packets, packets being retransmitted and stuff like that. Acknowledgement, uh, negative acknowledgement based on packets. So packet is actually a loose term uh, in uh, 5G. If we have to be more precise, precise at the level of MAC and physical layer. we should say it's a transport block transport block is a sequence of bits that go from the mac layer to the mm, uh, physical layer and one transport block is uh, sent in one tti uh, tti is again you know a consecutive uh, set of ofdm symbols 
to be sent on the air interface. So that so when we say packet loosely in uh, HARC, uh, we in 5G we really what we really mean is transport block. So what it means is that when a transport block is not correctly received by the receiver, you have to retransmit the transport block. So that is typically how it was uh, in earlier standards. But in 5G, you know, transport blocks can be huge. In fact, uh, tra a transport block block can be even as huge as one million bits. So imagine if such a huge transfer transport block, you lost maybe only hundred bits. You have to end up transmitting the entire transport block, which is actually a complete waste of uh, resources, right? So what 5G has defined, uh, they have defined a concept called code block group, right? Now some of you may be aware, you know, uh, code block group group is something which is new to 5G, but in 4G there was already a concept called code block. Every transport block along with the CRC is divided into code blocks and each code block gets its own CRC. So CRC is done at two levels, one at the transport block level and one at the CRC level. So which means that 5G has two levels of error detection which is possible. Error detection can be done here plus at the transport block level. So there is a little bit of protection there. Now the problem with code block is suppose this particular code block block is in error. Everything else is received correctly, which is really great because now if you want to retransmit, you need to retransmit only this one. So that is really good. But the problem with this approach is the signaling overhead will be high because like I said, the transport block is huge and code blocks are limited to only uh, 8448 8, bits. So the number of uh, code blocks in a transport block, block can be potentially huge. And if you have to send ACNAC for each of this, then it's going to be a mess. I mean, the signaling overhead is huge. So what uh, 5G has decided is, we can actually group some of these code blocks into a group called code block group, which is, uh, you know, signaled by RRC message. And when acknowledgements go through, they go through only at the level of code CBG, code block group. So let's assume we are looking at, let's say CB4 and 5. If CB4 is in error, CB5 was received correctly. You have to resend uh, both CB4 and CB5 because they are part of the same code block. The reason is when the ACNAC comes, it comes for CBG2. It doesn't individually say which one is in error. So when retransmission happens, it happens at the level of code block group. So I just wanted to highlight this which is again an important thing in 5G. Now, how are uh, feedback bits sent to uh, the sender? So there is a way to package uh, the bits and the way this is done is called a code, code uh, book. So 5G defines four uh, different types of code books. The first one is applicable only if you are doing CBG level retransmissions. If you are uh, doing retransmissions at the level of transport block, then this code book is not applicable. So this is applicable only uh, when you are doing uh, CBG level of uh, retransmissions. Then there are three more type one, type two, type three. Okay. So I will just cover the main one, which is type one and type two. So type one is also called semi static code book. Uh, so in this case, you know, the number of bits which you have to send in an ACNAC report is fixed and it could be potentially large. So let's say if you have uh, many component carriers, assume that uh, you have uh, six component carriers and each of them you have to carry 50 bits, six times 50, 300 bits you have to transfer for every ACNAC report. So that is the problem with the semi stat. I mean, it's not a problem if all the component carriers are active. But let's say in a particular transmission out of the six component carriers, only two are active. But instead of sending ACNAC for only those two, because it is fixed, it is semi static, you, uh, the receiver is forced to send all the 300 bits, which is again inefficient, inefficient use of resources. 
so to overcome this problem they introduced dynamic code uh, code book and enhanced dynamic code book so this uh, is uh, potentially uh, more efficient but it also is a little bit more complex uh, so to so i mean we'll not go into the complexity how uh, both transmitter and receiver communicate uh, how to see the thing is they have to have a common understanding how many component carriers are actually scheduled so that understanding comes by another uh, mechanism called downlink assignment index so i am just mentioning it in passing but if you go and look up the standards you will get more information so two more things i want to cover before i open up for further questions the first thing is the timing as you can see here this is where the acnac report is coming so the question is how does uh, the uh, network tell the ue where to send the ac and nac so uh, in this example what is happening is there is a shaded uh, blue here the blue shaded blue uh, represents the control downlink control which we can call it as pdcch uh, specifically uh, within pdcch there is a field called dci downlink control information that is what is represented here by the shaded area this is the pd uh, sch resource physical downlink shared channel where the actual downlink data is carried so now in this particular transmission uh, in this example three transmissions happen in three different slots and in each of this transmissions there is a control information associated with the transmission so what the network will configure is that the network configures for this transmission you send me a ac nac here so that indication is given in the control same thing it does for this transmission this and this transmission so in this example it so happens the network is scheduling this in such a way that the ac nac for all these three packets happen together and this is actually a smart and intelligent way to do things because instead of scheduling ac nac for each of this separately you club all the all of this together in a single ac nac report and when the ue forms this ac nac report what it's actually doing is nothing but forming the code book according to the rules of the code book okay so now instead of sending three ac nacs you club all of them send a single ac nac but let's assume you are uh, running a very delay sensitive application for a delay sensitive application if the data is sent here and the ac is coming here it is too late potentially you want the ac to be as close as possible in fact 5g is so dynamic the allocation is so dynamic that if you look at the first figure here this is how it used to be in 4g the uplink uh, uh, is synchronous downlink is asynchronous but look at 5g the kind of latency it is able to achieve within a single 1 millisecond slot or a subframe you can do the first transmission you can get the feedback which is a negative acknowledgement and you can do a retransmission so that is the kind of flexibility uh, that you can achieve in 5g so that is about the timing i wanted to touch upon briefly the last one is this which is a table so i told you uh, informed you earlier uh, in the previous image here this is carrying the downlink control information uh, uh, and uh, specifically that field is called uh, dci downlink control information so now downlink control information does scheduling both for the downlink as well as for the uplink and there are different formats you have format 10111200102 and some of these formats are introduced in release 16 so you uh, like if you are a protocol engineer or a designer if you look at this table even without reading the specs 
the, or the, uh, you will be able to figure out exactly why these things have been defined and why they have been defined in this way. So an experienced protocol engineer will be able to figure out by looking at this table, what is the purpose of these things? So uh, I will upfront say, if you look at this one, there is no variability here. DCI format 10, DCI format 00, everything is fixed, which means that it is very easy to encode and decode these two formats. There is no variability, everything is fixed. But of course, there are some things you can't do with these two formats. For example, code block level retransmissions, you can't do with these two formats. So for that, you have to go to a, another format called DCI format 11 and 01. So when you go into these formats, you can do code block uh, group level acknowledgements and retransmissions. Then come and uh, let's look at this one, DCA format 12 and DCA format 02. Now, uh, if you are uh, like a newcomer to protocol design, you may think that uh, this is so strange why they decided to design something like this because this is like uh, it can be incorporated as part of either this one or this one. In fact, uh, format 1.2 can be incorporated as part of format 1.1 one, one, and same thing here. So why is it that they had to design something new? So the answer is again very simple. The answer is when release 15 came out, uh, the standard body guarantees that it is going to be backward compatible or when future releases come out, the future releases will be backward compatible, which means that whenever additions are made to release 16, so all this, these things are added in release 16, it is impossible for them to change this because they, if they change this, it will break backward compatibility. So the only thing that the pro protocol designers can do is to add a new format, which will make the whole uh, uh, protocol backward compatible. And the same thing for these new fields, which are added in uh, release 16. Again, they are all added in a backward compatible manner. If you notice, all of them have a zero, which means that if these fields are missing, it will be uh, backward compatible with any release 15 entity. So when you look at uh, uh, you know tables like this, always think about uh, why the design came about and uh, what, what could be the reasons for uh, designing it like this. And how is 5G HARC different from LTE HARC? Uh, it's all described here. The main difference is in 5G, uh, HARC is asynchronous both in the uplink and the downlink. Whereas in 4G, HARC used to be asynchronous in the downlink and synchronous in the uplink. But then in later releases of 4G, from release 13 onwards, uh, it is possible to do asynchronous uplink HARC as well in 4G. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, LT uh, 4G is also always evolving. So if you look at uh, releases before release 13, you could say that uplink HARC is synchronous. But if you look at release 13 onwards, it could, it can be asynchronous as well. Now, why is the synchronous a problem in 5G or even in these kind of cases uh, in the release 13 uh, 4G? See, the thing about synchronous is if you remember, the timing must be guaranteed. Everything is happening at the right time. The act NAC comes three slots after the transmission and immediately the next slot, the retransmission happens. So everything is synchronous, which means that the resources must be guaranteed. But uh, in 5G, first of all, we use dynamic TDD. Resources are always uh, getting reassigned, reallocated. And secondly, uh, 5G and even 4G can operate in unlicensed band. So when you are operating in unlicensed band, it is not possible to guarantee uh, resources at the correct time. You may get resources depending on the availability. So the time will always vary. So that is why synchronous HARC is no longer suitable in both uh, 5G and uh, newer releases of 4G. 
for this reason. So these are uh, my uh, understanding of HARC at a very high level. Uh, we have exceeded the time by a few minutes, uh, but we are, now we can have some questions. Any questions, please? Hello. Yeah, Sujit. Yeah. Yes. So if we uh, if we miss uh, RV zero transmission, yeah, it will be, you miss the first first transmission new transmission. Yeah, and yeah. After that we receive zero so RV two, right? So RV two is not the self decodable. Not self decodable. So you have to wait till RV three. RV three. Yeah. And RV if we miss two. both zero and two. Then you have to wait till three. RV three is self decodable. And if, so uh, in that case, so if RV three is the first one, we can decode. Yeah, we can decode. Yes. So why we are sending in that order like a zero, two, three, one? If uh, two is not the self decodable, then uh, should not the yeah, because zero we wanted the alternate ones to be self decodable. The way the designers thought of it is they wanted alternate transmissions to be self decodable because when burst errors happen, it can wipe out, let's say, the first two. Okay. For that reason. Yeah. Thank you. To some extent, burst errors anyway are protected by interleaving, but this is an additional protection. Yeah. They wanted alternate ones to be self decodable. Any other questions? There is one more thing I didn't uh, describe here. Uh, see, there are some cases where uh, actually this is there in 4G also. Some of you might have heard the concept of TTI bundling. Have you heard it? So uh, uh, 5G doesn't call it TTI bundling, but they have a similar concept. What happens is sometimes the UE uh, is required to send all the three redundancy versions one shot. That means we see typically what will happen, you will send zero, you will wait for ACNAC, then you will decide whether to retransmit with two. But there is one specific feature in 5G and in 4G where all the versions are sent together back to back. That means TTI after TTI. In consecutive TTIs, they are sent. The reason for that is uh, there are some applications which are delay sensitive. So for delay sensitive applications uh, where the delay constraints are extremely high, that is the QoS requ requirement is very high, we are willing to sacrifice a little bit of bandwidth to meet those delay constraints. So the UE will proactively send all the three, all the four versions together. And the receiver uh, will have a greater chance of decoding them quickly. So that is important for delay sensitive applications. So that feature is also there. So one more question, Arvind. Yeah, please. So, in how in NTN uh, non-terrestrial network HARC will be? Like the delay will be very high, right? At the time we will send the HARC. In, in which the network? network would have sent multiple. In which network? In, network? in the next upcoming NTN, NTN non-terrestrial network. Non-terrestrial. I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, definitely non-terrestrial networks, you cannot get the kind of latency uh, you are talking about on uh, cellular networks because it takes time. Yeah, uh, so the delay will be very high. Yeah. yeah, but not so high as it used to be. See, uh, you have heard of Starlink, right? Yes. Yeah, Starlink is a low Earth orbiting satellite. So the delay is not so high compared to geostationary satellites where okay. it has to travel thousands of miles uh, delays in the order of seconds almost. Mm. So one one what, what I read from spec like they will increase the number of uh, HARC 232 
but uh, it will only hold up to 32 only no uh, number of arc is not going to change your delay the number of arc processes yes. that is only to make sure you utilize the channel that is not going yes. to change uh, if your system is designed in such a way that there is a limitation of rtt round trip time that limitation is going to be there take starlink which is a low earth orbiting satellite there you will have uh, rtt in the order of uh, tens of milliseconds maybe 30 40 50 milliseconds so here we in uh, 5g terrestrial network we are talking uh, uh, sub milli sub 1 millisecond we are talking about in this slide right yeah. within 1 millisecond you are getting the hack and then you are re retransmitting this kind of uh, be, round trip yeah. time is impossible with uh, satellite networks so will the so hard process hold for the atn also people hold but they, they the kind of applications will be different mm. it will be useful for them as well yeah. Because once we send the retrans, we send the ACH or NAC uh, HARC uh, to network, then network will again retransmit. It will take like a first retransmission itself will be in the order of millisecond. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's where system de designers come in. They will evaluate all these things. So they will select all the protocol parameters in such a way that uh, it is the design is as optimized as possible. So the standard body, whenever these standards are made, they don't uh, decide uh, based on ideas. They actually create a prototype, present test results, experimental results. Then they tweak the parameters. So like this, few iterations happen. Finally, after that only they will uh, conclude that, OK, this is the kind of thing we can adopt. And these are the kind of uh, applications that can be supported on this. So there is quite a bit of experiment that goes on uh, before standards are formed. Yeah, I agree. But uh, only question was like uh, this arc will have because the delay is, is high, right? Yeah. So same applications we run on cellular will be like uh, applicable for NTN or not. Yeah, so you actually you may be right for non-terrestrial networks uh, till you know for low earth orbiting we are still in the order of uh, less than 100 milliseconds right so yes. arc may be still useful but if you say that you know for 100 millisecond delay i can as well do arq at rlc then that's fine you can do it at rlc level there is no need of arc yeah that, that's right and remember wi-fi uh, worldwide technology it is not using arc doesn't mean that you know Wi-Fi is crap. Yeah, but on the basis of ARC only, like network select to reduce uh, their MCS or TB size and all, right? Mm -hmm. So it will be like a very long duration to to check for network side uh, to reduce the MCS or TB size or whatever. I think they use the uh, channel fault indicator also, no? So CQ is uh, based so CQ on CQ will also. be, yes. Yeah, so the second gentleman, CQ doesn't, uh, second gentleman's answer is uh, correct. Uh, because remember I talked about uh, explicit link adaptation and implicit. So although we say, you know, is, yeah. although we say in From 5G, HARC is adaptive, all the kind of adaptation it does is only incremental redundancy. That is the coding rate changes, code rate changes as you add more redundant bits. But the AMC, uh, the modulation order doesn't change. So for that, uh, as the other gentleman pointed out, you need the channel quality feedback. So that is explicit link adaptation. When you get the channel quality, at that time you decide, okay, I want to change the modulation order. Yeah, but at the time, same time, if we have a higher CQI, we see that the network may decrease the MCS based on the blur criteria. Yeah, yeah. So it, yeah this happens based on the arc, uh, their blur, blur, blur calculation based on their arc receiving echo make. Yes, they can do that. Yes. So, that, see, those things are not standardized because that is completely up to the implementation yes. how they want to play with it. 
okay yeah do it see yeah, these things a... need not be standardized standardization is for what purpose the purpose of standardization is the network should understand the ue ue should understand the network but whatever you are talking about how to adjust uh, and all that that is all internal to the network that is all not standardized that is where uh, the equipment vendors have their say that is how they differentiate ericsson may do it differently huawei will do it differently samsung will do it differently so that is their uh, unique selling point okay. standard may give some guidelines ultimately it is not standardized yeah just as an input from a wifi point of view right it is yeah. uh, based on the because uh, wifi the expectation is every packet transmitted by the file layer there will be acknowledgement by the receiver so if we if the acknowledgement doesn't come immediately the mcs and the rate starts changing from yeah. the transmitter side yeah thanks for sharing that uh, so is it like wait a stop and wait protocol at wifi Sudhir can answer that he is working oh, more. Sorry, closely. I didn't. Is it a stop sorry, and wait protocol? Wi-Fi is it a stop and wait? Oh, okay, I'm not exactly sure about what stop and wait protocol is about. Stop and wait but, is uh, uh, the you send a packet. You you cannot send the next packet until you get an ACK. Yeah. So the concept in Wi-Fi is the ACK. Uh, the once the uh, equipment receives a packet, right, it has to respond with the ACK within a within 16 microseconds. so there is a time period by which it has to return the ack so if it doesn't that means it's uh, it is assumed that it has not received the packet this i am talking only at the file layer not the yeah yeah uh, got it yeah, yeah, yeah. okay thank you and also actually i would like to one more point uh, in such cases like wifi the medium is uh, gets contained so uh, during that specific uh, window of time like nobody also cannot transmit uh, till uh, certain interframe spacing time is uh, expired yeah that is the csmsea protocol right that is there yes but uh, it's not about only csmsea right even the network i mean the channel quality is also what people are talking about so yeah in that context 